This conference will now be recorded. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm calling this uh, meeting of the Connecticut Green Bank Board of Directors, calling it to order on Friday, July 21st, 2023 at 9.04 a.m. So welcome, everyone. Um, so before we, we jump into uh, the agenda full, full, full force, um, do we have any public comments? Okay, no, hearing none, um, moving on. Um, this is in, in, we realized our last meeting, this is, uh, <laughs> uh, we're now in fiscal year uh, 24 and our last meeting was uh, really wrapping up fiscal year 23. And now as we begin fiscal year 24, we're gonna review and hopefully approve the revised uh, comprehensive plan going forward. And we also review yet again, um, how we did in fiscal 23. And this is always very helpful in terms, you know, what worked, really worked well, what needed more attention, you know, how, how, do, how do we go forward? And I love it that this board has always been really good about doing that. So um, we're going to do that. And we're also gonna present a few more transactions. So um, I think, you know, Brian, you wanna talk about the consent agenda? I see three items on it. Yeah, let me um, get to the consent agenda and uh, I will step back and provide a little bit more context as we've got some newer board members on. Um, this is the first meeting of the fiscal year. Um, as other meetings, it's important, but this one is especially important because it looks back. So we're going to spend some time throughout today's agenda looking at how we did. So you'll hear from the team in terms of looking back. Um, but on the consent agenda for today, we have the meeting minutes from our last meeting of last fiscal year uh, from June 23rd. Uh, we've got uh, in our package the incentive and financing programs and investments progress to targets for last year. Um, why that is important is because uh, we spend a lot of time in the summer and the early fall uh, assessing performance of staff to those targets. So those memos become foundational to our merit review process. Uh, and then we come back in October uh, with a final review and approval of uh, how we did in FY23. Uh, that would be consistent with our uh, annually audited um, annual comprehensive financial report. So you all might know in October, we spend a lot of time digging into that audit and all of our social and environmental uh, benefits are presented uh, within the context of that annual audit. Um, the third item is um, we took a look back. We do this every year at this time uh, on the board of directors um, uh, with respect to committing, uh, uh, board meetings and committee meetings. Um, so you'll see um, all of our board attendance, um, all of our various resolutions, um, our statement of financial interest that uh, all of the board members uh, do on an annual basis. Um, so this memo really plugs right into the governance section of our annual comprehensive financial report. So take a look at it. You know, it just provides an overview of how we did uh, throughout the year along with associated links to the various board meetings. So those will be resolutions one through three. Uh, and then in terms of other additional materials that we provided, uh, we provided our under 500,000 and no more, no more than a million dollars uh, of staff approved transactions consistent with our comprehensive plan and budget. Uh, we don't have any transactions to report. Um, we also included a memo on the under 100,000 and no more in aggregate than 500,000 of uh, transactions that are restructured or written off. Uh, and we don't have any transactions there as well. So we just provided a report out through those brief memos as you may have seen. Um, and just continuing with the best practice of uh, reporting out the uh, PSA, the Professional Services Agreement uh, request for approvals uh, per our operating procedures. Uh, any PSA over $75,000 um, gets uh, reviewed uh, and approved by not only myself, but also the chair per our operating procedures. So what you'll see there um, every July is this report out on how we did uh, with respect to that operating procedure. Uh, 
progress to targets for FY23. That's a document that just provides a summary uh, on the overall organization and how we did. Again, we're going to jump into that specifically throughout the course of today's agenda. Uh, so take a look at that, uh, including our progress to the Justice 40 commitments that we have, um, ensuring that no less than 40% of investment inures to vulnerable communities here in Connecticut. Uh, and then lastly, we included um, a lot more uh, substantive, descriptive um, documents on how the legislative session went for the 2023 period. So those are just a few report outs. Uh, but just broadly, thank everyone for your continued engagement as members of the board. Um, you know, lots going on, and uh, our team will review that uh, throughout the day today. So if we could uh, have a motion to approve resolutions one through three. On the consent so John Harrity. Uh, Brenda. Second. Bonnie Reed. Whoops. Who is that? Brenda? Brenda? Yes. All Wait. in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining? Okay, moving on. All right, so um, we are now going to jump into the recommendations on the edits to the comprehensive plan. Um, so again, just stepping back a little bit, uh, per our statute, uh, Connecticut General Statute 245N, uh, we are required to have a comprehensive plan um, that provides the guidance for our organization. Uh, in June, uh, the board approved of our targets for fiscal year 24 uh, and our budget. Um, so the comprehensive plan, uh, the red line revisions to it, as you saw in your packet, include those uh, board approvals, but also include uh, a number of other things. So I just wanted to go through uh, what you saw in terms of that red line document in your packet. Um, so we made some basic edits. Um, table of contents, footnotes, those sorts of things throughout the document. Um, we changed the, the executive summary to an introduction. Um, so rather than um, uh, calling it an executive summary that would summarize the rest of the contents in the report, it's actually an introduction, uh, which is uh, you know, a description of where we are today in terms of confronting the climate crisis from our mission, our mission perspective. Um, you all will see that um, a lot has happened over the last uh, six months since we revised this in January. Uh, we revised this document every six months. Um, so we wanted to reflect uh, a lot of those developments, you know, the wildfires in Canada, um, uh, you know, electricity rates uh, as a result of the war in the Ukraine, you know, those sorts of things are included in the narrative to provide some context to the reader up front. Uh, we included a few legislative updates from what happened in June, uh, including the clean energy definition change that uh, James reported on last month, uh, our filing of the RCIP final report uh, to our completion of the Connecticut General Statutes on our administration of the RCIP, uh, including the link to the independent review of the program. Um, we, we included the program updates from last month, the targets and budget, uh, we put some notation around working this year on our new measures uh, that have been approved, but we still need some work to do before we put them out into the market. Um, and then uh, reflecting some priority areas of focus, specifically around uh, our solar power purchase agreement product and affordable housing, ensuring that we help deploy more renewable energy resources for our affordable housing here in Connecticut now that we've got a great residential renewable energy solutions uh, incentive construct uh, and federal incentives through the Inflation Reduction Act that are going to provide additional uh, incentives to support those deployments. We also noted some emerging opportunities. You all might remember last spring we had the loan program office present uh, to the board uh, specifically around the state energy financing institution component of the LPO. Uh, through the um, IIJA, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, um, the LPO guy from last spring spoke about the CEFI provisions that were approved 
but when the Inflation Reduction Act was approved last fall, that was the funding mechanism to support CEFI. So you'll see some of that context in the federal funding opportunities now. Uh, and uh, Bert, myself, and the team are now working with the loan program office, other states in the region, to identify opportunities for us to uh, leverage the loan program office uh, investments to mobilize uh, capital in our respective states. Uh, of course, the EPA Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund is very exciting. We'll do an update on that. We included more narrative there. Uh, last Friday, uh, Vice President Kamala Harris announced the release of the notices of funding opportunities uh, through two of the three uh, competitions. Um, we'll cover that later on. Uh, and then we, we, we noted a new area of possible research. Um, if we have time uh, to dig into this area, we want to look at artificial intelligence from the perspective of not only our operations, but also how artificial intelligence might help uh, accelerate the uh, investment in and deployment of clean energy uh, in our state. Uh, and then uh, other items uh, specifically around uh, building our knowledge of community uh, and community engagement. Uh, we've got a long history here uh, at the Green Bank of engaging communities from being involved in you know, the 20 percent by 2010 campaign uh, back in the early 2000s to the Clean Energy Communities Program to Solarize. But a lot of community engagement's really been developing over time. And I think we're learning a lot from what's happening in Bridgeport uh, through Adrian's leadership on Communities Leap, uh, the local energy action plan. Uh, we're learning about the importance of community benefit agreements. Uh, and then as well, our, our continued partnership with Sustainable CT in connecting with all of our municipalities around uh, supporting what they want to advance on sustainability. So those are uh, some of the red line revisions uh, you would have seen uh, in the document. But specifically, what I wanted to do was to, to dive a little bit deeper in environmental infrastructure, uh, specifically for our uh, FY24 tasks. Um, this is uh, little Kea Welpton uh, Eisen. Um, Lee was going to be with us uh, at the last board meeting, but that day gave birth to little Kaya. Um, she called him uh, in a note that she sent uh, on Saturday, uh, a little burrito bundle of pure love. Um, so her uh, and her spouse, Corey, are now obviously spending uh, all time with little Kaya. Um, so, um, that is to say that um, before uh, she gave birth that Friday, during that week, she was working to the end. Uh, her, myself, and Ashley spent a lot of time thinking about what the tasks would be for environmental infrastructure in FY24. So wanted to go through those with you. Um, the first thing is that when Lee comes in, in uh, late September, early October, uh, one of the things she'll want to do is um, begin to assess where we are, you know, taking a look at all of our primers, having conversations with uh, folks in the field uh, to begin to start thinking about, okay, where could we focus our priorities in this huge, rich program uh, or scope of environmental infrastructure? So just kind of acquainting herself, getting her feet wet and, and getting ready to go. Uh, once she has that sense, then it's like, okay, well, what how do we think about building the team to uh, move forward to begin developing and implementing programs? So not just thinking about staff, but also contractual support. So we just ran a request for qualifications, which we do every three years. I think uh, Eric and Joe received some 30 plus different applications from different firms who can augment our staff to provide those services. So um, building that team uh, when she comes in uh, over the fiscal year will be uh, important. Uh, continuing engagement, uh, we still have one primer left, our waste and recycling primer. Uh, so we'll begin to uh, plan and think about uh, how we approach that primer, uh, as well as continuing our community engagement, having conversations with towns, uh, stakeholders, and the like. Uh, one of the things that we like to explore um, within our bylaws is the ability to create advisory committees. So as to just take a step back, have a conversation with you know, our ACG committee and think about uh, the role of an advisory committee that might be interagency 
you know, a lot of environmental infrastructure programs and policies uh, reside in our respective agencies, whether that's DEEP, um, Department of Public Health, Department of Agriculture, like you name it, there are a lot of programs out there that can be enhanced with private investment. So we're thinking about having some sort of advisory committee helping us think about um, how we might prioritize uh, investments in environmental infrastructure. Uh, of course, we have to raise resources. Um, so uh, we're working really hard now, uh, specifically around the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund. So we'll be looking at the landscape of federal opportunities, uh, not just there, although that's a priority area, uh, but other things as well, including foundations. Um, we think that um, given Lee's expertise and her network, that we will be able to uh, find some opportunities for program-related investments with foundations so that we can uh, work with them to demonstrate how the Green Bank model can advance uh, nature-based solutions as well. Um, so we'll be looking at that, uh, as well as, of course, our Green Liberty Bonds, where uh, we can issue up to 50 years for environmental infrastructure, you know, everything aligned with the useful life of that infrastructure. Um, so raising resources will be uh, a component of this fiscal year. Uh, launching products, as I was noting earlier, we've got some measures approved, but we still need to step back and think about how these measures uh, might be implemented. So we still have some more due diligence to do before we launch those products, um, the Smarty Loan as well as CPACE. Uh, and then lastly, just continuing uh, to identify research opportunities that that would help us think about more earned revenues from the environmental infrastructure, um, trying to make sure that we're always building a business case around mobilizing private investment here. Um, so those are the seven items specifically in environmental infrastructure that will become the, the work plan for Lee uh, and Ashley uh, as we uh, work to implement uh, those programs. I wanted to call that one out specifically because um, you know we didn't talk about it last month, um, um, but I wanted to relay that um, this was um, you know, Lee, Ashley, myself trying to continue to move the ball. We'll talk about later uh, how we did in FY22 and FY23 as we look back on environmental infrastructure, but this is just continuing to move the needle steadily uh, to some positive results. Uh, and that's it. That, that's the overview on those red line revisions. Are there any questions or observations anybody wants to jump in with yet? This is a uh, this is John Harity. I have a a stupid question, Brian. But it I I wondered. I saw a report yesterday that said that there were locations along the shore where. Uh, people could no longer swim because the water had bacteria in it or something. Under our new um, expanded role, do we somehow have something to do with that or how does that work? So a couple of thoughts. One is we're always defined by our mission to confront climate change. Um, so that at a high level is reducing greenhouse gas emissions and increasing our resilience against the impacts of climate change. It may be that that pollution going into the sound is the result of a changing climate. Um, so therefore, working with our partners on water uh, infrastructure, whether that is from source, you know, a lake through the rivers to the ocean, uh, and all the infrastructure in between, trying to find opportunities to mobilize and modernize that infrastructure question mark, right? This would be a part of that strategic assessment early on, how might we provide value there? Um, but I can tell you that, um, you know, we had a conversation with a number of stakeholders, environmental groups, um, and the Department of Agriculture specifically around uh, the role of, um, you know, shellfish, um, uh, oysters, uh, being able to take some of that um, nitrogen coming into the water system and actually, um, uh, uh, helping us reduce greenhouse gas emissions too. So there might be some unique nature-based opportunities. Seaweed kind of falls in there too. Um, you know, I have to say, this is Lonnie and, and I live at the shore. 
And what we're really seeing is this very old infrastructure with sewage treatment plants. And when we get these onslaughts of rain and you know the systems are really back up and overwhelmed, that's what this is. It's runoff from sewage treatment plants. And that's something that we've talked about for years, being able to kind of really look at, you know, the, the things that go in and the things that come out and how to improve those processes so that those plants do a better job and that the backup systems are, um, you know, more effective. So since we're doing resiliency, it feels like that might be an area we <laughs> that's right. carefully wade into. <laughs> And, and slowing down that water entering the waterways through bioswells and other things where we can create temporary sponges so the system isn't overwhelmed, as Lonnie yes. is saying. Yeah, because you know, we're hit, we're getting these rain bombs all the time now and it's just overloading our systems. Yeah, yeah. And they're old. You know, that's the other thing we were I mean, I still remember when sewage treatment plants were a new idea. Oh, we have one now, you know, and now you they've they've been around for years, they're old. Um <laughs> They really need to be revisited and redesigned in every way. Great question, John. This, now, John. This is Bettina. I, I know that DEEP has um, got people looking at this very topic. Um, might be worth a, a call over to the, or I'm not sure if DEEP's on the line today, but um, I, I know this is something that our office has been talking with DEEP about, with some of those shoreline communities and the sewage um, treatment plants, exactly what you're talking about, Lonnie. Yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah. Deep, deep is on the line, but it's the uh, energy branch deputy. No. <laughs> oh, hi. <laughs> <Not> the, hi. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I, I, uh, I would get very out of my depth, uh, no pun intended, very quickly. So um, I, I, I definitely yeah. recommend having the right people on for that conversation. Uh, yeah. To, to your point, Hank. Um, We'll work, we'll work and coordinate through you to the team. Um, as an example, uh, the DEEP team working on, you know, a lot of the stormwater issues that have risen in Hartford. Uh, we've had some conversations with the DEEP team around how the Smart E loan can help um, some homes address uh, some of that infrastructure. So some of that's beginning to happen, but once Lee gets here, it will have a, a much fuller um, uh, direction in terms of assessing that, but yeah, coordination will be key. I, I had just one other comment, if I might, uh, Lonnie, which is that um, just in general, that climate change um, had been something that was coming down the road and it has arrived uh, yeah. like a, a steamroller. And I was just looking at the Times had a map of the next week where the most dangerous heat uh, indexes will be. And you had so many different cities that were gonna be over 100 degrees for several days. So, you know, I mean, I think we've always known that our work was imperative, but if anybody does not feel an urgency about all this right now, they just look at the evening news um, that uh, this is the stuff that we're being asked to address. Um, yeah. So it's it just it just gives me so much more urgency about getting into it all. Thanks. Thanks, John. Anybody else, or do I hear a motion to approve uh, resolution four? So Lonnie. It's Matt. Hey, Matt. Um, uh, hey, um, I hesitated, but um, while we're piling on the miseries, um, I would also point out that uh, South Central Connecticut this past winter became a severe non attainment area under the Clean Air Act, which I believe now makes everything from the New York border uh, to the Connecticut River a severe non attainment area. Um, and maybe we should reference that as well because in addition to all the sort of um, very broad climate change issues, this is a very specific and data-driven uh, um, category under the Clean Air Act. And it's not uh, coincidental that New Haven and Bridgeport suffer from some of the most severe uh, respiratory-related issues 
especially among um, among uh, minority populations and children uh, of anywhere in the country, which doesn't really get a lot of attention. Uh, so the health impacts uh, are also very dramatic. Um, so talk about things we're charged with looking at. I mean, this really affects the lives of these, for example, kids who have huge absentee uh, rates, whose families suffer from additional medical burden, medical cost burdens, et cetera. So that, you know, that change is largely driven by transportation, which is also under our, under our auspices. But I just, uh, I didn't want to digress, but I thought in the context of that last discussion, I would mention it. Great point, Matt. If, if the board's okay with it, in the introduction, I see Sarah online, on here, we did include the Hartford stormwater as an example. We'll include the um, non-attainment as an example because providing those localized things is really important. Great. So do I, is anybody else want to weigh in? Do I hear a motion to approve resolution four? So move, John Harrity. Thank you, John. Do we hear a second? Second. Tina, I'll second. Okay. So that was Bettina? Yep. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Aye. Oh, good math. <laughs> Glad you got in there. Um, opposed? Abstaining. Okay, thank you. Bonnie. Yes. Just uh, before we move on, just uh, I'm seeing a chat here, which is a great recommendation from Joanna. Good morning, Joanna. Thank you uh, for joining. We got you now. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that would be great. Is having circa um, the uh, the Connecticut Institute for Resilience and Climate Adaptation at UConn come in and present the Climate okay. Vulnerability Index. So at a future meeting, we will um, work with uh, them to come and present. That's a great idea. That's a great idea. That's why we created them, actually. <laughs> as, as I recall, when I was in the legislature. Um, OK, and then moving on to um, item number five, financing programs, updates, and recommendations. And I guess, Bert, you wanted to introduce a key new investment member? Yes, um, as um, some of you know, um, sorry, I want to come on camera here. Yep, there we go. Um, the uh, the finance uh, team, is, the investments team has been looking for an underwriter uh, to assist in all the uh, various investment analyses that we have to undertake as well as risk management. And we've been looking for someone for some time and we found our candidate in Priyank Bhakta. Uh, he has uh, extensive experience, not only from um, uh, originally working at uh, uh, Clean Fund on commercial pace, which he'll bring that, uh, that experience to, to the Green Bank, but also uh, in the commercial banking world, he was at uh, First Republic uh, Bank, which is now part of uh, the JP Morgan Chase uh, organization. So we are very fortunate to have Priyanka aboard, <clears throat> and uh, I'm not sure if if he's uh, if he's on today. Priyanka, are you there? Hey, Bert. Yes, I'm. I'm here. Okay, great. Um, we're we're going to uh, be instituting some changes, and I just thought we'd just take a moment for Priyanka to uh, kind of brief the board just ever so briefly on what's ahead so that the board can have a heads up. So Priyank, I'll turn it over to you. Absolutely. Thank you, Bert. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, help drive the Green Bank's mission. So um, yeah, some of the exciting changes that <clears throat> we're implementing very briefly are revisions to the underwriting memo and process. So it's an effort to streamline the memo, which essentially will uh, remove some redundancies along with making it easier for the board and other members 
that review these memos to uh, quickly review them and get right to the information. So uh, more to come down the road, but that's that's it briefly. Great, thanks so much. Okay, uh, Chair Reed, back to you. Thank you, thank you. Pri Welcome, Priyank. Thrilled to have you here. Thank you, I'm excited to be here as well. Good, good. <laughs> um, and for uh, more of our uh, financing programs updates, uh, Mackie Dykes. Mackie? Great. Thank you, Chair Reed. Now for the financing program section today, I'm going to look back, uh, talk through the FY23 performance to targets, and then uh, looking forward, uh, got a strong start to FY24. We've got six CPACE, excuse me, six CPACE projects for a total of seven point, almost 7.4 million that we'll be presenting. So first to look back at FY23, uh, I'm going to focus on uh, sort of dive into uh, some, or dive underneath the hood a little bit here on a few of the programs, uh, and then we'll look at everything together. Um, so first off, the uh, power purchase agreement uh, program. Underneath this, there's several different efforts uh, or channels that we look to, uh, to, to drive projects towards that overall goal, which was 19 projects for a uh, total amount of funding of 13.7 million uh, and 7.6 megawatts. The first two lines of this, the state and uni, that's our solar map program, our solar municipal assistance program. Uh, as you can see, um, and we did very well with, with that program this year. Um, the program that we built with the state, the solar map for state agencies, is now fully developed as a framework to develop solar projects with, uh, with the state. It represented a majority of the PPA projects closed in FY23, accounting for 50% of the projects and 84% of the, the total capital deployed. These are uh, a lot of them are very large projects. Um, so that, that effort has been very successful. Um, we had we didn't anticipate any muni projects this year, just given the um, how those port the timing of how those portfolios move. Um, but we did have a few stragglers from last year uh, that, that ended up closing this year. So we got five projects there. So overall, when you look at the solar map program, it is the main source of PPA projects. It's 78% of our total amount of projects and 92% of the, the capital deployed. Uh, if you look at the, the next line, uh, multifamily, uh, unfortunately, no projects, no PPA projects there. Uh, we were hopeful that the policy framework that we've been working for years now to stand up uh, would be fully in place and we'd be able, you know, we'd be very active in the market. Uh, that took a little longer than we thought. Uh, we spent the year sort of finalizing that. Eversource and UI started taking applications for those projects in January. Uh, we built a whole new uh, financial product. We, we're doing a lease structure since those are buy all, sell all. Uh, we developed the financial modeling for that, we, all the documentation and everything. And we're working on a, a few pilot projects now, but just didn't get any of those closed this year. Um, so our hopeful next year, we'll, we'll start to see some, some deployment in that mission critical uh, sector. Moving on to the developer channel, this used to be our primary channel for PPA projects. This is where uh, contractors, developers bring us projects where they've you know, originated the customer, they're, they're the developer, they're taking all the risk. Uh, they bring it to us for financing. Uh, this is, uh, as you can see this year, we only got one of those projects. Um, so this is a is increasingly less uh, fruitful channel for us. Uh, this is really something you know we're, we're going to focus on going forward. Uh, we're going to devote some more staff to cultivating these relationships. Uh, I mean, you can view this as a positive or negative thing. Uh, on the positive side, it means that there's a lot more private options available now. The market's matured, so we see a lot of the contractors that we used to work with uh, going to other providers. On the negative side, you know, it, it means less capital deployment for us. So we're going to devote more staff time to this uh, and and see if you know there's still a market out there that that needs needs our assistance. Um, and then finally, the debt to third party. So this is where uh, we are uh, outside of our partnership with with IPC. Um, we are providing 
debt to other third party owners. Uh, think of the Skyview relationship that we've had in place for years. And in fact, these four projects are uh, through that Skyview uh, partnership. Uh, we hit our target here of four projects from this channel. They were just a little smaller than we uh, had thought. Um, so the, the capital deployed and capacity was slightly under the target. However, when you roll all this up together, uh, look at the bottom line, uh, you see that we're uh, meeting and even exceeding two of our, uh, on the capital flow and capacity side, we're, we're exceeding the targets. So overall, very happy with where this program ended up for the year. Um, I you know, hope to see even more success on the multifamily side uh, when we're having this conversation next year. I saw a chat come through. Um, question is lack of PPA multifamily projects due to marketing regulatory insufficient incentive or other um, I would have said a couple of years ago it was regulatory and insufficient incentive but I think the green bag played a primary role in fixing that um, now we've got the market created um, for the most part you know there's still a few kinks to work out with uh, the application process with Eversource and interconnection issues and things like that. Um, but I'm pretty confident that uh, we'll be able to work that through with our pilot projects and then start to scale our efforts this year. For our Solar for All uh, Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund application, this is a, a key component of, of that. So you know, hopefully we'll inject a lot of capital into it and, and really scale that effort. Thanks a lot. Mackie, this is Lonnie. I'm just apropos of that is pura engaged in this it feels like that could be helpful very much so yeah they <laughs> the legislature passed the the policy needed to fix the incentive issue two years ago and then pura stepped in to to implement that new policy uh working very closely with a working group that they created of us uh deep department of housing and the connecticut housing and financing authority uh, uh, Chaffa. Um, so, you know, through, you know, we're meeting, that working group is still meeting every other week. Uh, we're putting recommendations into Pura uh, to continue to refine the existing program, but, you know, I think we've got, uh, they've put a good framework in place that the utilities are now implementing uh, to, to, to create that market. Hey, Mackie, it's, it's Matt. Is this, uh, I think, three or four quick comments. One, uh, compliments on the solar map program, uh, Emily, you, Alex, and the whole team. Uh, you know, I, I've seen that firsthand and um, uh, towns and towns really like it. I mean, it gives them a lot of comfort uh, and it's, I think, a great project. I, I think there's a lot more to be done there, like a lot more market for us there. On the, um, on the housing side, I would say, you know, I've seen in my zoning practice, a lot of projects just got derailed or shelved with market forces. So that, that may come back, but I agree with you. It may be a good sign that there's so much private financing out there. That said, I think the Green Bank plays a really important visible role, even in projects it's not involved in, because having that product out there is, uh, you know, with the, with the PPA agreement that the Green Bank has, sort of is the good housekeeping seal of approval. So it, a lot of other PPAs mirror the terms that are in the Green Bank uh, PPA. So it's a good levelizing presence the Green Bank has. Um, the other two things I'd say is one is on the, on the buy all option on the NRES. I think, I don't know where it's ended up, but there's that issue with the tax treatment of those facilities. And I, I've seen that cause a lot of concern and even stop a few projects. I don't know if that's been resolved. I don't think it has. Uh, so I think that's an issue that if the Green Bank can continue to play a role in resolving whether or not those buy all facilities are um, eligible for, you know, to be tax exempt. And uh, lastly, I think another space where we should look this coming year at is start you're starting to see a lot of battery storage projects in the same space either standalone or not and most of the uh off taker community or the host community has no idea what to, how to evaluate those contracts sometimes 
they don't get any benefit. So I think that's a place where it's kind of a new market and the green bank can do its normal thing of being a clearinghouse for information and good, good projects. Great. Thanks for all those comments, Matt. Uh, I'll pick a few things out there just in the uh, interest of time and one that's most relevant, I think, to the CPACE presentation, our project presentation. Uh, we'll make here soon the the buy all sell all tax issue. You're right; it was not resolved at the statewide level in the last legislative session. Um, you provided us good direction in the last board meeting on this, uh, and then through subsequent conversations, uh, that in this interim period where we're kind of in a gray area, um, we are having a conversation with our borrowers about what that gray area looks like. Um, where we've developed language, very clear language in our disclosure of risk around this. Um, we are pursuing a, uh, a legal opinion, uh, outside uh, council legal opinion, uh, on how we view it, that it's you know, that they are exempt in, in most cases. Uh, and then we're also going to uh, you know, try to work within the state to, uh, to get some guidance on that. But I think we'll, you know, ultimately it comes up to the municipality and how they uh, interpret the the, the existing law. So in many cases, the property owners in these in these uh, for these projects are going to their municipality. You know, when we have the conversation with them, they they turn around and, and go to their their uh, tax assessor and and figure out how they're going to view it. So uh, we are trying to navigate it as best as we can uh, and continue to do projects. Okay, next slide. Uh, CPACE. I'll try to be quick here. I don't want to eat up too much time. Um, this goal, you know, there's really two elements, the projects that we fund and then the, the private lenders uh, where, you know, that's really driven completely by them. Uh, on our side, uh, we were under target on the number of projects, but just slightly exceeded our capital deployed. Um, so, you know, we did see the investment in clean energy projects that we wanted to see. Um, on the private lender side, uh, we did we really just base this on historical performance because we don't have a lot of insight into their pipelines um they were we saw a sharp decrease uh in the conversations that i've had uh they they really attribute this to more of a, a national issue um or at least this northeast um they, where they saw a decline in, in cpace activity uh and they i, I Tried to solicit uh, feedback to see if there's anything we need to do on the programmatic level in terms of our design or administration or anything. They, they think we've got a great, especially new construction program, which is really where they're focused. Um, so I think it's just a matter of them, you know, there being the activity in that space in Connecticut and then them getting into those projects. Um, I think the market here looks good though, in, in terms of our mission of attracting private capital, uh, because you see you know, 35% uh, was of the investment was public while 65% was was private and we are really filling a gap here. We are doing smaller retrofits, uh, which the the private lenders really aren't focused on. So I think this is a great example of the uh, the sort of Green Bank mission at work. Next slide, and then finally the for everything together, um, SBEA our partnership with EverSource to provide capital to their on bill uh, energy efficiency financing program. Um, slightly below target on the number of projects and even more, we had 83% for the, the capital deployed. Um, and then on the multifamily term, uh, we're still working through some data issues with, with Eric here, but ultimately we, uh, the, the key here is we closed out the, the, the there's two loans there uh, of the health and safety uh, loan, which is uh, administered by IPC, is funded from a grant from DEEP. Uh, we we lent out or IPC lent out the remaining capital they had underneath that program uh, for two projects. So that's for the time being is closed out uh, until those funds recycle through. Uh, so bottom line, you know, we're I think really within in pretty good shape for the for financing programs. Uh, I'd like to say within the margin of error in terms of our projects and, and capital deployed, and then primarily thanks to Solar Map, we uh, vastly exceeded the the solar capacity. Uh, targets. And then in terms of where that capital is going, uh, vulnerable communities versus not vulnerable, we exceeded our 40% goal um, of, of investment in vulnerable communities, uh, hitting 53%. So I will pause there uh, and take any questions.
or comments? And if none, we can move right in, roll right into the projects. Great. All right. Um, Elise Buzelli was the transaction manager for this. Uh, I don't think she, she was tied up at a doctor's appointment. Elise, were you, have you been able to join yet or should I cover it? All right, I'll take this one then. Uh, next slide, please. So our first project um, is a uh, just over uh, $560,000 loan for a solar PV system and a, a roof replacement. The solar is $428,000 and the roof is $120,000. Uh, this is a property built in 1975 and then purchased in 2016 by Ledge Light Capital. Um, there's seven units within it. Um, two of the units uh, are, which would represent the largest of the square footage, around 70%, uh, are in the industrial manufacturing sector. And one of them, New England Pump and Valve, is, is actually uh, the, the, the property owner. To go to the next slide. Um, here you see sort of the, the basic uh, financial metrics. I'm gonna turn it over to Louise in, in just a second. Uh, to, to talk through the, the underwriting, but if you can go two slides ahead, I think, yeah, one more, there we go. Uh, key, another key number to point out here, uh, the savings to investment ratio, this one is right over one. Uh, this is another example of, um, of the roof, you know, the, the property owner maximizing the CPACE financing to, uh, to, uh, to get a new roof. Um, we did, uh, you know, per the, the guidance we've gotten from the board, offer a sculpt and amortization uh, for this project to try to um, smooth out the cash flows uh, somewhat. Uh, they're, they're still considering which amortization profile that they, they want to take, um, but we, we definitely put that on the table and you know, we'll, we'll go with whatever direction they ultimately decide. Um, next slide. Okay, Louise, can I turn it over to you for any points on the, the underwriting you want to make? Thanks, Mikey. Uh, just the point I wanted to make on the underwrite is that we predicted a forecast net operating income uh, of $110,000 per year, and that is uh, led to a healthy average debt service coverage ratio across, across the term of 2.88. And um yeah those are those are the key parts of the underwrite thanks great thank you louise uh next slide there we go the resolution so i'll pause here for questions or turn it over to you chair reed for the to handle the resolution does anybody have any questions okay do i hear a motion to approve resolution five so moved rob Hodley. Thank you, Rob. Um, do I hear a second? I'll second, Adrian. Thank you, Adrian. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining? Okay. Thank you. Moving and on. Rest Mackie, these... that's still you, right? <laughs> now, actually, um, for the rest of these, uh, Catherine Duncan has, is the transaction manager, so I'm going to turn okay. it over to her to present them. Great. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Mackie. Um, so the first, the next, the next three transactions are owned by the same holding company and uh, a company called West Rock Development. It's a real estate development company with over a million square feet of rental property in the tri-state area. And um, these are the first of five transactions we should see. The other two should come back after the, if they win tariffs in the next auction. So um, 1069 Connecticut Avenue in Bridgeport is adjacent to the next project. They're, they're actually owned by the same legal entity, and um, but we treat them separately as they're separate tax parcels. And um, this will be just over $1 million in, um, in solar with roof improvements. The roof improvements for all three transactions are significant. Um, so next slide, please. Um, 
All right, so these are the metrics. It's the, they're, they're all 15-year loans at 5.5%. Um, the loan to value is, is well within our, our ratios, as is the DSCR on this one. So uh, next slide, please. Yeah, again, uh, just the terms, solar roof, just over a million dollars. And I think Louise um, will be speaking to this slide. Is that right, Louise? Thanks, Catherine. So on on this underwrite, we forecast a net operating income um, per year of $380,000, um, which gave an average debt service coverage ratio of 1.28 across the term. And um, using a mortgage style amortization for this particular underwrite. Thank you. Next slide. Okay, because the roof is a big component of this project, it brings the SIR, uh, SIR down to just, just over one. Um, and the roof, roof is largely the impetus for all three transactions. And uh, next slide. Yeah, so then I think we pause now for the uh, resolution. Okay, does anybody have any questions? Do I hear a motion to approve resolution six? So moved, Rob Holding. Thanks, Rob. Uh, do I hear a second? Second, John Harney. Thanks, John. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining? Okay. Thank you. Moving on. All right. Next slide, please. <clears throat> okay. So 1085 is the adjacent property. Um, this is a bigger solar array, uh, 563 kilowatts for just over a $2 million project. And um, again, there's a large roof component to this transaction. Uh, next slide. Same terms, five years, uh, 15 years, rather 5.5%. Um, again, the LTV is within our, our um, ratio and uh, a good uh, sound DSCR. Next slide. Okay, so uh, just over two million in construction loan to WRCT Avenue. Again, that's the same entity that owns both 1069 and 1085, um, both in Bridgeport. Next slide, Louise. Thanks, Captain. So this one has a forecast net operating income of two hundred and twenty seven thousand um, dollars. We we sculpted the amortization on this particular deal. That's due to the low savings to investment ratio and the, and the impact that that would have on the DSCR if we used mortgage style amortization. So with a sculpted amortization, um, this stays at one point three across each year of the term for the debt service coverage ratio. Thank you. Okay, next slide. Well, we, we saw the 1.01 uh, SIR and again, largely due to the roof. Next slide. And as the we, oh, I'm sorry, that red no roof, that's an edit that I forgot to do. <laughs> that should not be there. There is a roof. And um, this transaction has a, as she, as Louise explained, a sculptured amortization schedule um, to make sure the DSCR exceeds our, our goal over the term. Um, the roof is a hefty component, as you'll see there. And um, if you exclude the roof, the solar has an SIR of 1.72. So you can see how the roof impacts that. Next slide. And this is the, the sculpted amortization schedule that's been designed. I don't know if anyone wants some time to look at that, but it's also in the memos. 
so um, I guess go to the next slide, please. And Chair, read the resolution. Thank you. I think, did Matt have a lot of input on the sculpted approach? I thought. Well, I think if I if I'll I'll take a shot at answering that, and Mackie and Louise will correct me if I'm wrong. But I think that Matt's intention is to keep the SIR um, positive for each year, if possible. And th in this instance, Louise was working on keeping the DSCR positive for each of the of the years. So it's a slightly different thing. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We would have in this case setting aside what what Catherine just said. You know, it's our standard practice now to offer sculpted amortization uh, when we see from on a project basis uh, any negative annual uh, SIR. Uh, so that, you know, anytime the, the CPAS payment exceeds the the savings from from the project. In this case, we didn't even give the property owner that option because when you, we looked at the full financial underwrite, the DSCR of the entire entire business, we we wanted to, you know our requirement is an average of 1.25. They didn't meet that unless we sculpted the the, the amortization. So we sort of we forced this one uh, upon them. Um, I, I think it's worth pointing out that even with that that sculpted amortization that we still see uh negative cash flow from a project perspective um i you know, i think that that's just indicative of of where the market is right now with large large solar projects and the uh, uh the inres program it's just incredibly competitive uh and the uh the tariffs right now are you know are, are quite low so we we can make the projects pencil, um, as you saw the, the the pretty great SIR for just the solar component of this. But you know, when when you add in the roof, uh, you know, which which is the property owner's goal here is to maximize the, the CPAS financing for the roof. Uh, but you know, sort of get the the profile we see here. Oh. Thank you, Ma Mackie, Catherine, and team. This is Brian. Uh, uh, just a thought uh, as we're working through these slides, uh, Bridgeport stood out to me and what came to my mind was energy communities, the, the additional 10% yeah. adder. Uh, I'm wondering if going forward on our tear sheets, we can include you know, IRA benefits that come through our financing as a way for us to track how we're leveraging the federal funding. So, so not only in this case, you know, the energy community adder, but also if we get the full 30% ITC, that addresses prevailing wage and apprenticeships. Um, and then to the extent we're dealing with affordable housing, you know, the low income tax credit. So just something for us to think about in terms of the tear sheets. Um, you know, we might look at SIRs within the context of uh, additional adders to, um, but anyways, just the uh, Bridgeport stood out at me as you all were presenting these from that perspective. Okay, so that brings us to resolution seven. Any questions or observations anymore? Do I hear a motion to approve resolution seven? So moved, John Harney. Thanks, John. Do we hear a second? Second, Matt. Thank you, Matt. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? abstaining okay thank you moving on okay so the next slide please this is the third property that's owned by the west rock group <clears throat> this one's in danbury and again it is virtually the same story as the one above uh, a decent sized solar array with a uh, significant roof component. So we're at nearly two and a half million on this transaction. Next slide. All right, so we have the same terms, uh, 15 years at 5.5. Um, loan to value is within our range, a little bit on the higher side than the others, and DSCR is, is, is sound. Next slide. 
So two point almost uh, yeah two point four million construction loan, converting to a term loan, solar in Danbury. Um, again owned by Westrock and Louise. Thanks, Catherine. Yeah, so this one, we, we forecast a net operating income of $265,000 for the property. Um, similar to the previous deal, because of the low savings to investment ratio and the high roof component, we did have to sculpt the amortization profile. Um, but by doing so, we achieve amortization uh, debt service coverage ratio of 1.28 across the term. Thank you. And, and just to, to reiterate this, you know, like Mackie said for the previous transaction, this is sculpted and so the DSCR is in good shape, but the SIR is negative um, despite the sculpting uh, for the same issues that he flagged. Uh, next slide. Hold on, just, it's not negative. The oh, SIR is I'm negative. sorry. <laughs> uh, I think in, annually <laughs> the, there's negative cash flow from a project perspective, correct? Yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, not negative. <laughs> All right, next slide, please. Uh, so we're at a 1.01 .01 again on this one. Uh, next slide. And again, same error. I apologize. There is a roof. Didn't take that edit out. Uh, sculpted amortization, as we've discussed, uh, same low SIR because of the roof. But um, should we exclude the roof? The, the, the solar itself has a sound. Um, SIR. Next slide. Sculptured amortization schedule for anyone who wants to read it. And next, resolution, please. Okay. Anybody questions or observations? Do I hear a motion to approve resolution eight? This is Bettina, so moved. Thank you, Bettina. Do I hear a second? This is Adrian, second. Thank you, Adrian. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining? Okay. Thank you. Moving on. Okay, now we're going to Stanford. Um, and we're switching owners now, new new group entirely. So this is 397 West Avenue, um, Benjamin Properties LLC is the property owner and the, the only tenant is Murray Benjamin Electric Company. They've been around for ages and um, they are putting on um, solar and there is no roof here. Let me just make sure I'm right. Uh, yeah, no roof, no roof. So that's all solar right there. Um, so just over uh, half a million in solar for um, an electric company. Next slide, please. Uh, they're going for a 20 year term um, at 5.75. Uh, nice value on the property, a nice loan to value and a sound DSCR. Next slide. Uh, so more of the same, just over half a million dollars. Um, and this is the, uh, oh, all five actually are smart roof solar, um, which is interesting. Every one of these transactions has come in from the same, the same contractor. Um, uh, next slide. And this was Priyank's. Do you have anything you'd like to speak to on this slide, Priyank? Sure. Thank you, Catherine. Um, as Catherine mentioned, it's a very strong SIR of 1.39x, and DSCR was utilized um, with the market-based appraisal, which was completed in March of 2022. So happy to take any questions if, if the board has any. Okay, there you see that strong 1.39 SIR. Next slide. I have, I have a, a question. Just for a site like this, it looks like it has some um, industrial component. Um, could you remind us, do we do uh, like a phase one or any sort of environmental um, check on, you know, the, the potential contamination issues on the property? 
so um, when we receive an application, we always do a process we call pre-screen. And as part of that process, uh, we pull a standard environmental summary on the on the property. And um, the fact that there is no additional environmental information says to me that that must have come back low risk. Um, because if it comes back with an elevated risk, we take additional steps. And um, I'm fairly certain we didn't on this project. I'm just quickly opening that report. And yeah, it did not come back with a high risk. Um, Okay, so I, I, I just think, I, yeah. I forgot what the process was. That's fine. Yeah, Thanks. that's the process. I just needed to refresh my memory, but yeah, that we did not come back with any elevated risk flags, and so um, so yes, we do that for all projects. And no, there was no issue on this one. Thank you. So, uh, Chairman Reed, the resolution. Yes, absolutely. Okay, so uh, resolution, we're at resolution nine and uh, counting. And uh, so <laughs> does anybody have any more questions or observations before I move to approve? All right, we hear a motion to approve resolution nine. So moved. This is Bettina, Bettina second. Thank you, thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining? All right. Thank you. Moving on. Okay, to New Britain next. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, 191 John Downey Drive in New Britain is owned by um, E.R. Hitchcock Company, and they do business as Hitchcock Printing. They are going to install uh, 227 kilowatts of solar, and they are doing roof improvements. Um, next slide, please. So it's just, it's 680,000, um, 15 years at 5.5. Um, that's a nice LTV for us. Next, oh, and look at that DSCR. <laughs> uh, it was a nice relief after some of the earlier ones. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, yeah, so 680,000 on solar plus roof. Next slide. And Louise, was this you again? Me again. Thanks, Catherine. Um, yep. Yeah. As Catherine said, great DSCR on this one because of the um, $310,000 forecast net operating income and the fact that, you know, there's um, not a, a huge roof component. So really great savings to investment ratio of 2.02 and that helps a DSCR of 4.3 over the term. Thanks. Next slide. Yep, there you have see the 2.03. Next slide. And Chairman, read the resolution if there are no questions. Do we have any questions or observations? Okay, do I hear a motion to approve resolution 10? Bettina, so moved. Thank you, Bettina. A second? Matt, uh, Matt second. Thank you, Matt. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Anybody abstaining? Okay. Thank you. That was a lot of work you. that you folks have done. <laughs> a lot of work. Very impressive. Um, now I think we're moving on to item ten, uh, item six rather, uh, incentive programs, updates, and recommendations. And that's um, it's got to be Sergio, right? Sergio Crillo. Yes. Good morning, Chair Reed. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, um, Sergio. Uh, I'm going to do a quick overview of the fiscal year 23 progress to target for the incentive programs team. Um, that includes. 
the energy storage solutions program, the battery storage program, and uh, Smarty. Uh, from a numbers number of projects perspective, I think all programs did well individually, but by far the greatest contribution came from Smarty. Uh, they they blew it out of the water, and there with 1,249 projects, which is roughly 78% of the total number of projects in the fiscal year. Great job. Um, from a capital deployed perspective, Smarty performed incredibly well. Uh, again, uh, they exceeded the target by 56%. Uh, the commercial portion of the battery storage program um, contributed 70% of the of the capital deployed numbers. Very very strong performance uh, by the by the commercial portion of ESS. Uh, but the residential portion of ESS did not do well, unfortunately, and uh, did not do well for reasons that we have discussed in the past, um, including the fact that large TPOs or third party owners and developers are not or have not joined the program yet. That includes Tesla, Sonova, Sunron. They, they have a very large um, market share of the solar PV, of the residential solar PV in the state. And without them, it, it, it's going to be an uphill battle. So we were working with them uh, to facilitate their uh, joining the program this year, hopefully. Um, there have been delays on the, on the official launch of the Posigen offering to their customers. There, there are high battery installed costs, et cetera. So all these reasons combined have slowed down adoption in the, in the residential uh, segment. But there is a, a, an important caveat to me to do here, that is, is the terms capital deployed, right? It's a, it's a term we use in the company uh, throughout the, the programs. Um, and all these projects, as you all know, have received uh, approval from the Green Bank. We have given these customers um, reservation of funds letter, the ROFs, saying, okay, we're holding those funds for you once you come online. Um, and all these projects have applied for interconnection with the with the utilities. But the interconnection queues with the utilities are incredibly long. Um, the average project takes two to three years to to clear the queue or to be approved by the utility, sometimes more than that. Um, and uh, these represents a significant risk to these projects because the longer it takes for the utilities to approve these projects, the higher the chances of these projects that uh, uh, will not happen. Uh, so we're currently working with Pura, with the utilities, uh, uh, to try to find solutions to the, to the long interconnection queue wait times. So any questions? related to that all right um and then uh, i just uh, uh this is john Herney. excuse me i not a question but i just find it outrageous that the uh, i know there's technical issues but you know this is a question this is like another situation which just my personal opinion the um you know utilities uh, uh, make a lot of noises uh, like killing us with kindness but at the same time they drag their feet and and that's not the way we're going to move into the future with this stuff. So I hope that Pura um, acts to really tighten up that process so that they're not given that opportunity two or three years on uh, 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 you know to solve the issue of um, you know the linkage is is just ridiculous. Uh, uh, sorry, just uh, my personal opinion. <laughs> John, I think you're you're yeah, you're right. I agree with you. Uh, the the first step in this process is to is to have the the utilities 
understand that yes, a, a project, the fact that a project needs to wait two, three, four, five years, sometimes longer, it's an issue. It's a real issue. It's a real threat to us uh, achieving our clean energy deployment targets, right? To 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 um, meeting uh, public act 20, 2153. Uh, deployment targets, right? The one that says a, a thousand megawatts of uh, battery storage by 2030. And uh, they, they're still in the position that the, the, pro the process is complicated and it takes that long to complete. Um, so yeah, it's, it's frustrating, but we're working with Pura. We're, we're engaged right now with Pura and the utilities. And, Hopefully we will be able to come up with solutions. But yes, I totally agree with you. Um, and then on the on the um, on the capacity, um, on the capacity uh, and numbers, Smarty did very well. Uh, the commercial portion again of ESS did exceptionally well exceeding the target by 10%. And I, and I say exceptionally well, because we, as you, as you may remember, uh, we run out of capacity in tranche one, right? Those 50 megawatts that were expected to last until 2024. Well, we run out of that capacity by March of this year. We have to open tranche two which is a hundred megawatts of capacity, the capacity that was expected to become available only in 2025, we have to move that tranche to 2023. So anyways, I think there is an unanticipated uh, strong interest in the commercial portion of the program, which is, which is great, it's very good news. Um, and the other, the bottom table uh, is the, um, is the deployment in vulnerable communities. As you all know, we have a 40% deployment target in vulnerable communities and LMI uh, customers. Um, and as you can see, uh, we're well on track of, of meeting those targets. I think it's 40% by 2024. I think we are, we are well on track. We should not have any problems. Is there any questions? Related to that, once once Posigen, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, launches the program, and, and I think they are about to, uh, we will be able to increase those numbers significantly. So I'm confident we're going to be able to uh, hit those numbers. Any questions? Yeah, Sergio, uh, this is Rob Podling, uh, DECD. Uh, just very quick, just revisit the. Um, Interconnect backlog, I put a question in the chat, but just a very quick question. Is it really about lack of resources by the utilities that's creating the backlog? Is that really what it is? Robert, I I feel that that's the, yeah, that's the bottom line is people. People, got it. That's all I need to know. Thank you. Yeah. Not enough um, people or not enough people thinking in the right direction? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> probably, probably both. Yes. Most problems are people. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. yeah I, I, I agree with you. Uh, if they don't think at this point, they still don't understand that this is an issue, then we have a bigger problem. So that's what we're trying to do right now. Okay. And, and one, one follow-up question, then I'm done. Uh, just one more. Are the same folks who do residential inter interconnects the same who do commercial interconnects? Are they two different pools? Are you aware of that, or, or is that a pure question? I I think it's different developers. Yeah. Got it. Okay. All right. Thank you. I have other conversations going on, so I appreciate it, Sergio. Thank you. No, no problem. Thank you for your questions, Sergio. Could, yes. I, could I add a quick comment, and maybe you could opine on it a little bit um, on the interconnection queues. You know, there there are a number of projects in the interconnection uh, queues from residential, non-residential solar, you know, a lot of projects, including our battery projects. But would you say in terms of the commercial projects or energy storage solutions that they're meeting other policy objectives like 
on the grid edge um, in low income communities, you know, in critical facilities whereby they should be treated differently than other projects because they serve a greater function, a great a greater policy function. Brian, I think that's a very good point. Uh, the the way I understand this process, it, it seems to me like it's a first in, first out type of uh, uh, the way they clear the queue, right? And uh, both solar and uh, ESS and battery storage programs are sitting, I mean, our projects that we filed within the last 18 months are sitting behind 500 projects that might be meeting other objectives. So I think that's a very good recommendation we, we want to make to Pura in the sense that, I don't know if we need to create a separate interconnection queue for battery storage programs, or if we can prioritize those projects serving vulnerable communities or that are located on the grid edge to, to be able to clear the queue sooner. Uh, so that's, I think that's one of the recommendations we're going to do, we're gonna make here. Great point. And right. uh, just one last thing, uh, Brian, maybe offline or Sergio, can you send me your recommendations only because DECD has to put in a package of recommendations uh, to the governor's office. And uh, this, so just send me what you have offline or we can have a follow-up. Thank you very much. We will, Robert, thank you. All right, uh, next slide. Um, okay, and now we're going to review um, six projects, uh, six commercial projects uh, for which we're seeking approval of upfront incentives in, in the amount of $6.8 million. Uh, joining us today is Darren Hamill. Uh, Darren is Director of Battery Storage in the uh, Strategy and Business Development Group with C-Power. C-Power is the the, develop, the developer and the proponent of these six projects. So I ask Darren to join us in case you have uh, some questions that Ed and I cannot address. Uh, and now let me turn it over to Ed Kranich. Ed is Senior Manager of Battery Storage. He, he's the leader of the program and uh, he's gonna walk us through these six projects. Ed? Thanks, Sergio. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes, yes. We can. all right um all right so um so we'll get started here um so as sergio mentioned all six of these projects uh were brought to us by c power and all six of these projects are utilizing a tesla mega pack uh or some uh combination or configuration of multiple tesla mega packs um so the first customer here ess 309 in suffield um, the customer is Praxair. Some of you may be familiar with this company. Yeah. They have a few locations in Connecticut. Um, this is a location up in Suffield. They produce industrial gases, um, all kinds of purposes, you know, scientific, welding, um, even hydrogen. Um, so this is the largest uh, ESS project that we've seen so far. This is almost 18 megawatts, which is just massive. <laughs> uh, 36 megawatt hours of capacity. Um, this is a, a very big consumer of electricity, clearly. Um, total cost is about $15.2 million uh, with an expected upfront incentive um, of about $4.5 million. Um, the 10 year performance uh, incentive that we anticipate based on, I think, pretty conservative factors of how the battery will be used, how often it will be charged is about $11.9 million. Um, this can, of course, change depending on how the battery is used, whether it's used more um, for demand management during the day, and maybe it's not available during some of these um, active dispatch events. So uh, time will tell exactly how the battery will perform, um, but these are just kind of the expected, uh, expected numbers here um, in, in terms of the performance incentives. Uh, so on the next slide, there, 
Okay. Uh, so the next two projects um, are located in Meriden, uh, and they're both for Ragazzino Foods. Um, this first one is Chamberlain Highway. This is um, so Ragazzino Foods um, is a manufacturer of white labeled food products. Um, they also do some of their own branded food products. Um, as someone who grew up in Meriden, I remember eating Ragazzino pasta and sauce from an early age. Um, so this project um, is, I believe, this is the two. This is the two megawatt Tesla Mega Pack. Um, they have two of these going in um, at the Ragazzino food sites that are just down the street from one another. So you'll see in the next next slide is is also for, for Ragazzino Foods. Um, this is a project about two and a half megawatts, about five megawatt hours uh, at a total cost of two million forty six thousand dollars. Expected upfront incentive uh, comes out to five hundred thousand dollars. This is considered a critical facility because it's food um, food manufacturing um, with an expected 10-year performance incentive of about $1.6 million. Um, and actually, Darren, if you're available, could you describe just the differences between these two Ragazzino locations, uh, if one is manufacturing and the other is distribution, or if, if, if you know? <laughs> Hey, sure. Yeah, having walked through both of them, they they both appear involved in in manufacturing. I think they're relatively close to each other. So, a product of uh, expansion of the business and creating kind of new manufacturing lines. But both facilities seem uh, it, there's not really a clear distinction. You know, distribution versus manufacturing. They're both pretty similar in that sense. Okay. Thank you. Um, and I believe this one is two mega packs. The other one is one mega pack that we'll see on the next next slide. So this one is slightly smaller. It's about one megawatt. Um, again, very similar to the first one. It's just right down the street. It's probably 200 yards away. Um, expected upfront incentive for this project uh, specifically, uh, $241,000 with an expected 10 year performance incentive of $638,873. Uh, next slide here. Um, so this is for ESS 522 in Thompson. Uh, this is NUMA Tools. Uh, they are a local manufacturer of rock excavating uh, equipment. Um, so for everything uh, from gas and oil drilling uh, to also geothermal drilling. Um, this system, this is the one mega pack, uh, 964 kilowatt, 1.9 uh, megawatt hour battery um, at a total expected upfront cost of $819,000 and upfront incentive of $334,000. Um, this project has an expected 10 year performance incentive of $638,000 uh, approximately. Um, this one is a little bit below the uh, rim uh, of uh, of 1.4, but overall uh, these these projects do net out um, on average to to being over our our goal of 1.4. Uh, next next slide, please. Uh, so next slide, ESS 525 in Milford. Uh, the customer is Colonial Coatings. Um, they are um, uh, a manufacturer and provider of anodizing, sealing, and thermal coatings the air in the uh, aircraft industry, including Pratt and Whitney and Sikorsky. Uh, this is 1.9 megawatt, 3.8 megawatt hour battery uh, at a total cost of 1.6 million uh, six hundred thirty-seven thousand dollars expected. Uh, with an upfront incentive of uh, $481,750. Expected total 10-year performance incentive of $1.2 million uh, over the 10-year period. Um, and finally, uh, the last project, uh, ESS 637 in Newington. Uh, this is PCX. Uh, it's a 
high precision machining and mechanical systems company. Um, they are headquartered in Newington, Connecticut, um, and they build rotorcraft assemblies, uh, parts for helicopters and aircraft um, for military and civilian uh, aircraft. Um, they so this this project again Tesla Mega Pack, uh, 2.3 megawatt, uh, 6.9 megawatt hour system uh, at a total cost of uh, $2,964,000. Expected upfront incentive for this project is $783,652 with a total 10-year performance incentive of about $2.3 million over, over the 10 years. Um, this one far exceeds the, the rim uh, coming in at 2.28. So overall, uh, rim average for these projects does uh, just does stay um, close to or above the 1.4 uh, measure for the program. Um, Sergio or Darren, uh, any additional notes you'd like to bring in um, on, on the development of these projects? Ed, I, I would just say that those performance, expected performance incentives are in nominal dollars so when you bring them to present value it's uh, it could be probably two-thirds of that maybe one in this in this one uh maybe 1.5 million dollars mm -hmm. okay. but that, that applies to all six six projects six slides mm -hmm. and uh maybe another comment on the rim that you you saw that some of the projects uh have a rim the ratepayer impact measure that is under the 1.4 goal for the for the program however the rim the the rim one the 1.4 rim target it's for the portfolio of of projects so we can have a couple projects that do not meet the 1.4 but overall on an aggregate basis we are well above 1.4 at this point Great. Thanks, Sergio. Thank you. Okay, resolution eleven. Does anybody have any uh, any questions? I, I have a comment. Just is that um, this whole roster of um, uh, you know, um, especially manufacturing places that we're helping to uh bring into uh a non-fossil fuel uh uh a power generation it's it this is really exciting this is um cuz number one it shows a lot of economic activity in Connecticut which we haven't seen and it also shows that these programs are getting the kind of traction that we had always hoped that they would have and um and these are a lot of people that are employed by these companies. So it just is, uh, it's great. And I really uh, applaud the people that have been working on this stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And I love all the communities that they're in. And there are different communities and different size communities and communities with different personalities. And it's, it's so great to have this stuff on display, um, you know, as many places as we can. So well done, everybody. You know, I just wanted to add to that, that, I grew up in Stratford, and and I'm old. So I when when I grew up in Stratford, Bridgeport was the machine shop of the world, and so seeing that the economic activity in Bridgeport um, with these commercial properties that are employing people after Bridgeport has had such a period of like really sort of near death, it's really great. And um, I think that a lot of things are happening in Bridgeport, and it would be great to see it known not only as the Park City, but the Green City. Okay. Um, anybody else? Any other observations? Okay. Do I hear a motion to approve Resolution 11? So moved, John Herity. 
Thanks, John. Do I have a second? Second, Rob Hodling. Thank you, Rob. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining? Okay, great. Moving on again. Hi, Madam Chair, members of the board. Thank you for this. Um, I just wanted to give a quick update as to how we're building our balance sheet, our investment progress to targets. So as many of you will remember, um, we really started tracking our progress to targets in terms of how much of our own cash we're getting out of the door um, a couple of years ago. And this is really in response to the 2018 uh, raids that we really put another set of eyes on our balance sheet to make sure that we were continuing to build it. And I'm pleased to report that we beat our targets for the year. Um, we set, we really set two targets here. Um, one is officially a target and the other is more hidden in the budget, but I wanted to call both out. Um, so first on the top chart, you'll see new commitments that we made through transactions that were approved. The top being CPACE programmatic transactions. And the bottom second, the bottom section really being what came through Capital Solutions, where um, uh, various facilities are using our financing. Um, we set a target of doing about 15 million in new commitments and approved transactions. We have an internal bar of about 4% for 10 year money. We um, achieved an average weighted average interest rate of 4.6% for new commitments for an average tenure of 25 years. Um, the present value of this interest income is 8.2, uh, I'm sorry, it's uh, 6.1 million, um, with the total interest income being 8.2 million. In terms of cash out the door, so just because something is approved doesn't necessarily mean it's going to come to fruition. So we like to track both. Um, the bottom table is really getting to what we did in terms of our own cash out the door to previous commitments. So um, we had a budgeted number of 37. 0.4 million, we exceeded that um, and were able to disperse uh, 46.9 million. I just uh, reviewed this um, with regard to where the money is flowing and looking at this, um, we are hitting that 40% target for vulnerable communities in terms of investment as well. Um, so great update here and we'll make sure that we update with the final numbers after our books are closed in the next several weeks. Any questions? With that, thank you. Okay, thank you, Eric. So does it, this sounds like Bert. Thank you, Chair Reed. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to uh, pass, pass the mic immediately over to Louise. Uh, she'll present uh, this transaction. Thank you. Thank you, Louise. Okay. Thanks, Thank Bert. You. Next, thank you. This slide is the one. So I've um, we've come to the board today to talk about uh, our transaction with Skyview Ventures. Uh, it was entered into. It's a loan facility for commercial solar financing. It was actually entered into back in 2020. Um, we've come to the board several times since then to discuss it and amend it. So the current arrangement we have with Skyview is that we have a debt facility sized at $10 million. And of that 10 million, we've advanced 6.6. .6, and we lend that money to a special purpose vehicle that currently owns 41 commercial solar projects in Connecticut. That's 5.1 megawatts in capacity. And this time we are coming to the board uh, to ask for uh, permission to, to change some of the structure of that facility. And the reason is because Skyview, since the uh, investment, since the Inflation Reduction Act was passed last year, which gives solar developers like Skyview freedom to monetize federal investment tax credits in, in new ways, Skyview is seeking to, to take advantage of, of one of those new ways to monetize ITC, uh, which is actually the selling of tax credits. And um, it, what that means for us as lender is that Skyview wishes to establish a new special purpose vehicle 
um, that will be able to sell its tax credits. We still want to be involved in financing the commercial solar projects that are owned by that special purpose vehicle. And so the request today is to uh, not change the, the facility size, uh, but actually to just allow uh, CGB to lend to this new special purpose vehicle um, separate to the one that we have been lending to so far. So what's not changing is the facility size. We also will not change the way we diligence projects that we lend to, uh, not changing debt service coverage ratio, and uh, we're retaining our requirement for a parent level guarantee from the, uh, from the top company, from Skyview Ventures in the structure. Next slide, please. Oh, short but sweet straight on to the uh, resolution here for the, the request to amend the existing loan facility. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, on resolution 12, do we have any questions or observations? Yeah, this is Bettina. So are we moving everything from the old SPV into the new SPV or does this start from ground zero with the new SPV and what would happen with the, what's in the old SPV? So we're not moving anything from the old SPV that will stay as it is with its 41 projects that are have been financing or that have been financed. Uh, the, it will be the new SPV that is owning the projects that Skyview is developing going forward, and those are the ones that we would finance under a, a new set of loan documents that would completely mirror our existing loan documents just changing who the, the borrower is to the to the name of the new SPV. And how much of the 10 million has been drawn on under the old one and how much is would be left over for the new one if that's how it works? Yeah, so they've drawn 6.6 .6 million, but because the oh, right, three, the three years into they've actually already repaid eight hundred thousand of that. So okay. uh, because because of the way it's structured, uh, they've they've got a runway of 4.2 million uh, that they can they can borrow under the facility. Got it. Okay, thank you. Perfect. And and just to be clear, uh, Louise, the borrowing could go between the two facilities, correct? Yeah. If if if, if that was the request, we we could still lend into the existing SPV. It's just that we've been told that the new SPV is what Skyview is using going forward to, to own its solar projects. And to yeah. get those extra tax advantage credits or whatever they are, the, the ITCs. Okay. Thank you. Okay, any more, any more questions or observations about resolution 12? Do I hear a motion to approve? This is Adrian, so moved. Thank you, Adrian. Do we hear a second? Rob Hornling, I'll second. Thank you, Rob. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining? Lonnie, this is Matt. I'm abstaining. You're abstaining, okay. I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. At well, least I would abstain on all these, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> because you're busy <laughs> um okay so matt's abstaining uh anybody else all right all in favor aye 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 opposed and we have one abstaining all right thank you Okay, so back to me, Chair Reed. Good, good. All right, so this is back to Bert. So, uh, so this is this is something uh, many of you are familiar with our Smarty Loan Program. It's our our flagship uh, loan program for single-family homes in in the state. Uh, the Green Bank, uh, as as you know and appreciate, does not actually make these loans. It's been our philosophy that uh, we work through local lenders, and uh, we facilitate uh, that lending by providing a loan loss reserve as well as programmatic support 
uh, for uh, determining the energy efficiency and solar PV and now battery storage and soon to be on the horizon uh, resiliency upgrades uh, with our environmental infrastructure uh, responsibilities. So this has been a very, very popular loan program uh, with uh, the community as well as as lenders and contractors. Uh, it's, a, it's a very flexible product and has resulted in um, a hundred and uh, more than 120 million. It says 116.3 down there, but it, it's it's uh, it's well beyond that at this point in time. Uh, but um, in terms of investment and 100 at least 110 million dollars in actual loans. I think the last year, Eric can correct me, but I think we had uh, about uh, 1,100 and 1,250 loans and maybe about 23 and a half million of actual loan volume. So very, very robust. Uh, the issue has, as was written up in the memorandum and which was actually discussed with the deployment committee uh, back in, in April, uh, back in May, is that uh, the Federal Reserve uh, has been increasing interest rates. If you're, if you're in the market for a home mortgage, um, you're not fond of that uh, that fellow on the slide. Um, he he uh, he and his committee members have been responsible for increasing interest rates uh, several times over the last year or so, uh, and and mortgage interest rates are now in the seven percent region after being around three percent for for a long time, uh, and uh, and other interest rates, car loans, uh, five year car loans in the vicinity of uh, between six and a quarter to seven and a quarter percent something like that uh, depending upon the actual lender uh, so everything has gone up across the board uh, as you can see on the slide there so um, when we had our um, discussion with lenders this spring uh, ipc um, and the Green Bank met with uh, all the lenders on a roadshow to, to touch base. Um, a number of them were, were saying they were really getting concerned about the interest rates, uh, the not to exceed interest rates. What you see there are not, e not to exceed interest rates. So rates can be lower than that. Certainly in today's environment, they will not be lower than this, um, but they cannot exceed this level. So, and, and uh, as lenders are um, running out of capacity, some, some are actually lending more th than, uh, than they have in deposits. When that happens, they have to go into the market and either um, get brokered deposits or go to the Federal Home Loan Bank Board and, and, uh, and get uh, short-term funding. Um, those funds are above 5% these, these days. So you can see uh, that the margins for, in that, those cases for five and seven year smarty loans will have completely vanished if not become negative. It's not a situation which is sustainable. We were under the impression that this was uh, more of a, a limited experience and we came up with a link deposit program that we were, we have implemented uh, on a case-by-case -case basis, uh, but um, in recent weeks, uh, we've uh, come under increasing pressure from the lenders to provide some headroom to the rates. So um, given that it clearly these, these rates, although we love them, and so do the contractors, and, uh, and so do, um, and so do our so do our borrowers like these rates. Uh, we felt we had to take action. Just before I move on, uh, link deposits are where the green bank places a deposit with a, a lender at a particular agreed rate, which is typically below market, in order to encourage uh, a particular loan program. In this case, the Smart E loan. Uh, this is the first time we've done link deposits. They've Link deposits is a concept that's been used uh, in e, uh, ESG lending um, uh, on occasion. Uh, a number of uh, lenders have done that. Uh, so I think we'll, we'll see that in the future 
uh, you know, here and there as programs are trying to uh, promote certain activity. But anyway, um, let's move on to the next slide in the interest of time. Um, the, uh, you can actually uh, really go beyond this because I've already spoken to all of these points. Here are the uh, here are the proposed new smarty rates, not to exceed rates in the far right hand column. The reason we are coming to the board uh, is because specifically in the program agreement with the lenders, it says that the rates can only be changed uh, by an action of the board of directors of uh, the Green Bank. So it is with this that we bring it to you for approval. Um, with these adjustments here, this should make uh, give enough. We've talked to the lenders about this, and this uh, seems to be broadly acceptable. And um, and we hope that with interest rates coming, hopefully coming down in 2024, at least starting a downward tra trajectory, that lenders would use that not to exceed level uh, to be more competitive and come inside of these these uh, these loan rates as shown here on the right in the right column. Uh, and uh, and come back to uh, more affordable rates, although these, in the current market circumstances, these are uh, certainly affordable. So uh, with that, Chair Reed, I turn it over to you to uh, to, uh, to ask for a resolution and vote, which is on the next slide. Hey, Bert, it's Matt. I have a quick question. Um, because we don't know what the future will bring, would it make sense to uh, adjust the rates to be the lower of the rates you proposed in that table, or the federal rate? Uh, if you know, to the extent in an environment later on the federal rate goes down and we still have our rates left higher, to have it be the lower of the lower the of what you just had in the table or some whatever the federal index is for for borrowing. In other words, so if, if in the future, hopefully, <laughs> uh, interest rates go down, we don't have ours set at a level that, you know, anticipated higher borrowing costs. Yeah, I, that's, uh... Thanks for that that suggestion. The reason we'd be reluctant to put anything firmly in writing uh, on on that score is because you know the the shape of the yield curve can be peculiar and do odd things to to interest rates. We you know we're we're spanning several years here from from five years to twenty years. And uh, I, I think it would be better for us to just kind of observe and see how interest rates are changing and, and um, moving over time and, uh, and just be attuned to the market. I think you know, this, the current interest rates have stood the test of time. Um, I think we, we, got it, we got it pretty right in the beginning. Uh, to hold for 10 years is just amazing. Uh, I think that you know, for the time being, I think we'll just we would prefer to go with what we have here uh, without any kind of links to uh, uh, to, to an index, uh, although we're certainly keeping our eye on uh, the, the financial markets in that regard on a daily basis. I'm seeing, this is Lonnie, I'm seeing Bettina has a hard stop at 11, and I'm just wondering how we're doing quorum-wise. As well as time was. <laughs> I, I also have a hard stop at 11. We would, uh, if Bettina and Matt left at 11, we'd still have a quorum. We would? Okay, good. Actually, I can I can squeeze out another 10 minutes, but 11.10 is my outer limits. Thank That's you. We appreciate. Yep. <laughs> this is, I keep saying this is the most responsive board I've ever been on. I I really appreciate that everybody not only uh, takes the time, but they really get up to speed on these things. Give their all. So thank you. So uh, resolution 13, do I hear a motion to approve? So moved, John Harity. Do we hear a second? Ms. Rob Bolling, I second. Second. Thanks. Thanks, both of you. <laughs> all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Opposed? 
abstaining. Okay, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Moving on, I think we're we're at our environmental infra infrastructure programs. Brian? That's right, and I'm hearing that beautiful clock behind you there, Chair Reed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, just uh, we're coming down the road, the, the line here, so we're almost done. Uh, so just uh, continuing with the report outs on the fiscal years. Um, so I wanted to do an update on environmental infrastructure and just do, do a recap in terms of FY22 and what we achieved in FY23. So FY22 was really the year that the governor's bill, a public act 21-115 passed. It passed in, uh, in June on a bipartisan basis. So we really spent a lot of that first year looking at our governance, making sure all of our documentation integrated the new public policy. Uh, we took a high level view at our bond potential uh, because public act 21-115 allows us to issue uh, 50 year bonds for environmental infrastructure. Uh, it also expanded our access to the special capital reserve fund from 100 million to 250 million uh, within that bill. Uh, we spent some time looking at our product lines to see where um, environmental infrastructure could plug into what we were already doing. So the Smarty Loan, obviously, as Bert alluded to, is a good place, uh, as well as CPACE, which we subsequently saw last year with the passage of uh, a policy that expanded our CPACE. Uh, abilities to support resilience. Um, we spent a lot of time, uh, Ashley and myself at the time, Ashley was a consultant uh, to the Green Bank uh, doing various stakeholder meetings. So we wrote up all of those in the primers uh, that are now available. I, I like to describe those primers as, you know, if you read it, you are 75% knowledgeable on what is happening in Connecticut with respect to the market the policies and the stakeholders on that specific sector. Um, so they're, they're a pretty big lift, uh, pretty good uh, resources in terms of those respective sec uh, sectors. Uh, and then of course we had our strategic retreat in the spring of uh, 2023, which resulted in the development of the comprehensive plan that we see today, um, which includes now environmental infrastructure. So that's what we spent in FY22. Uh, then this year, looking back on the performance this year, so the key tasks we had were to build the team. So we uh, were able to bring Ashley from a consultant to uh, an employee of the Connecticut Green Bank. She is our manager of community engagement. Uh, and we were able to hire Lee Welpton uh, as our director of environmental infrastructure. And she'll be starting in late September, early October. Um, we continued our engagement. Um, we um, brought to the board last month our environmental markets guide, uh, which is a 101 look at carbon offsets and ecosystem services. Uh, and we wrapped up our water primer. Um, so uh, we put some time and effort into getting those resources available. Uh, we did uh, raise some resources. Uh, we've been working with the Department of Insurance and a number of our other state agencies on a climate smart technologies and home medical devices in affordable housing projects. So when you think about really bespoke projects that hit really important targeted communities, in this case, ensuring that the impacts of climate with its heat, whether uh, that affordable housing has the appropriate heat pumps and weatherization, along with uh, when the grid goes out, making sure that they have battery storage. Uh, we've got a project that we're working on now, including uh, with Brenda and her team at Operation Fuel, uh, Yale University School of Public Health uh, and a, a nonprofit organization called the Clean Energy Group that's providing us technical assistance. So uh, we're, uh, we're doing some research and development, I would really call it, um, and that project has been supported by the Robert Woods Johnson Foundation, uh, specifically because of our Connecticut Insurance Department uh, leadership. Uh, and then, of course, we're now engaging in uh, the EPA's Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, uh, one component of which could be um, land and agriculture uh, within the um, National Clean Investment Fund aspect. I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, and then we continued our progress on new products. Uh, we uh, brought to the Deployment Committee a look at two areas, uh, climate uh, adaptation and resilience and water measures. Uh, so we've gotten those approved, but we still have some work to do uh, before we begin to implement them. So we are going to dive a bit further on that as I spoke about uh, in this year's plan. Uh, and then, uh, you know, we've got some research and development uh, funding that we use. Um, one project that we supported this year was to look at 
uh, Hartford's Parks and Recreation Assets. So we're working with the Trust for Public Lands and a local uh, Hartford nonprofit. This is like our corporate community. And uh, we actually have young people in our community this summer going out and about in parks around Hartford, looking at the different assets, you know, canopies, place wings, you know, all these sorts of things in our Hartford parks with an eye towards um, looking at parks from a bioswell perspective. How can these parks um, become uh, sponges for uh, downpours when we uh, receive the impacts of climate? to also helping us deal with shading tree canopy uh, in reducing a carbon emission. So, uh, uh, you know, an R&D project that we had. So that's that's kind of a report out. Uh, we did uh, fairly well on those tasks. And again, as we look at FY24, we're just trying to keep the needle moving until our leadership comes into place and we build our team and capacity to really go full full throttle on it. But I'm, I'm happy to take any comments on, on, on this. Uh, look back. All right. Um, we have uh, one final resolution, one final transaction here, which is the continuation of our um, relationship and partnership with Sustainable CT. Uh, Ashley is out on vacation, so she has tasked me with uh, giving this presentation on her behalf. Uh, I would say that um, uh, just an upfront disclosure. Um, I serve as co-chair of Sustainable Connecticut, along with uh, Laura Francis, who works with the Southern uh, Regional COG. Um, so uh, we co-chair uh, Sustainable CT. It is a, a fantastic group of local leaders who are um, advancing a, a number of different sustainability efforts across, I think we're at 131 of 169 towns now that are registered uh, within sustainable CT. So you can imagine uh, your local clean energy sustainability task forces that work with the town uh, to pursue various uh, areas of sustainability. Um, uh, we've worked with sustainable CT now for I think going on five years collectively within our comprehensive plan. They serve as a really great resource to connecting with communities. So as we were talking earlier about Solar Map, our municipal assistance program, uh, a lot of our relationships come uh, with and through a Sustainable CT as a partner there. Um, uh, just in terms of what we worked on this last fiscal year, fiscal year 23, uh, we continued our municipal outreach um, uh, for our Solar Map program. Uh, we closed a number of projects. Um, those projects lead to our deployment, uh, as Mackie was talking about within our solar PPA program. When we look at that investment and deployment in municipal assets, that's great. They're gonna be reducing their energy costs as a result of that. Uh, as we also make those investments, as Eric was talking about, it generates interest income. So those 4.2 megawatts of deployment will generate interest income back to the green bank the way we look at that is the, uh, the more deployment, the more interest income, it allows us to support more of this uh, community-based marketing activity. Uh, we work with Sustainable CT on CPACE programs. Uh, they host webinars, uh, and we have a really good group of, uh, of fellows this summer. Uh, I'm gonna have lunch with one of them coming up here uh, who uh, support uh, regional COGS uh, in helping them um, implement uh, their respective uh, uh, certification programs. Oh, and just one more point. Uh, there are a number of projects. We also provide some support for local uh, community match fund projects. There is a, uh, an element of sustainable CT where they have an online crowdfunding capability where local communities create their own projects. Uh, foundations, uh, as well as the Green Bank, provide some support to match the crowd. So if the community proposes you know, a project like this supporting, you know, Manchester cycling, uh, you know, a community farm learning garden project. Um, uh, the community has to raise funding and if they hit their target, it's matched by various resources. So it's a way to get community investment uh, into these projects. As I was talking about earlier, we're learning more and more about how to support community. Uh, and as they invest, we want to invest and support them. Um, so um, our grant proposal this year is a $150,000 grant. It's a $25,000 more than last year. Uh, our focus this year is really now helping sustainable CT think about 
environmental infrastructure within the context of their certification programs. So now not only are we going to be looking at solar on the rooftops of municipal facilities or energy efficiency benchmarking for municipal facilities, but now helping them think about agriculture, uh, water, waste and recycling, all our environmental infrastructure things. So this will plug us into that process, working with stakeholders to start to build out some certification areas. Um, I think that's it. Uh, this would be a strategic selection given uh, 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 our various um, operating procedure uh, components, um, and that is the recommendation. Hope I did Ashley justice. <laughs> um, this is Lonnie, just quickly, and in a community anaerobic digester component at all? I, um, I, so I think about the, the size of digesters, the expense of what we went through, for example, with Southington, a $10 million yeah. anaerobic digester. Yeah. That's a large infrastructure project. But to the extent we're supporting the community to think about composting and getting people to compost, which then gets the local municipality to think bigger. Okay, can we collect more? Okay, if we collect more, can we do anaerobic digesters? Now that we're starting to think larger infrastructure, that's where I think in the future, we're gonna to start to see smaller projects lead to more larger infrastructure development projects. That's where I think we want to be with, with sustainable CT when it comes to environmental infrastructure. Big food waste gatherers, farm, you know, farm waste supporters. Yeah, now it just feels that, and particularly with the prices rising for communities to to deal with waste, <laughs> um, they're going to be looking at maybe combining resources with other other regional communities to to think about these these kinds of uh, options. Okay, so resolution fourteen. Anybody any questions or comments? Do you, I hear a motion to approve resolution 14? So moved, John Harrity. Thank you, John. Do we hear a second? Second, Adrian. Thank you, Adrian. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Opposed? Abstaining? Aha. I think that is that's it. That concludes our agenda. And um, did you have anything else to say, Brian? Or are we? Yeah, just quickly. The only thing I would say is uh, that the greenhouse gas reduction fund is now fully in play. Um, as I was alluding to before, the vice president announced the final two components of three last week. So our team, we have an internal team as part of our Dream Bigger strategy uh, that is all about show me the money. Uh, so our focus now is to work really hard with our interagency consortium on the solar for all requests. So DEEP is our, gonna be our lead applicant in Connecticut for solar for all. Uh, and our consortium includes uh, DEEP, Pura, uh, the Department of Housing, Chaffa, the Department of Banking, uh, and the Connecticut Green Bank. So we're looking forward to over the next uh, couple months supporting DEEP with that application there uh, and engaging folks out in the community. Uh, and then we've got uh, that application is due in September, late September, the 26th. And then we've got two more applications that require us to be a part of somebody else's application, uh, eligible nonprofits. Um, it's a really interesting definition. Uh, our team has been working really hard with a number of groups to uh, align uh, our objectives with uh, what they're trying to achieve in terms of the National Clean Investment Fund and the Clean Communities Investment Accelerators. Um, so lots of work for our team over the course of the next three months. Uh, I think we'll be able to take a breather uh, before Thanksgiving, hopefully if we can uh, plug ourselves into all of this. And our goal, as uh, Commissioner Dykes likes to say, is to try to bring uh, an unfair share of this to Connecticut. Um, if we <laughs> step back and look at all of this, you know, the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, um, you know, we are a large part, the Connecticut Green Bank of proving the Green Bank model, and here it is uh, at the country level. Um, so uh, we want to uh, get our own fair share. So lot, lots of work left to do. That's the update. Okay. Anybody else want to weigh in? Hey, Brian, I just had, a, okay. I, I wanted to uh, uh, 
suggest to the Green Bank um, for CPACE or something to target um, the marijuana growers of the state for solar as a group. I mean, they're, they're, uh, I think that they're susceptible to it because of their uh, image. Noted. I guess the the last thing maybe another and this is just to Bettina's point uh, she might we might have lost her uh, but she had suggested that we um, try to bring board members back in person um, for those who can not everybody can uh, but I think uh, Eric you and I can work together to figure out how we can work with Cheryl and the team to um, get our space uh, back for in-person meetings. Um, so we will uh, make attempt at that, most likely through our committees, uh, and then roll it out to the board once we've got it um, fig all figured out. That's, I'm just saying that because our, our rooms here aren't uh, as big as the conference rooms before, so we need to manage volume. And that's it, Madam Chair. That's good. I'd like to be back together in person with fellow board members. So that's good. I'm glad uh, that's under discussion. Um, so is anybody desperate to keep this meeting going or um, <laughs> um, may I adjourn I'd it? A, I'd make a motion to adjourn. Thank you. Do I hear a second? I'll second since my mic is open. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. OK, all in favor? Aye. I, I looking oppose. forward to those in-person meetings. <laughs> oppose and, uh, uh, and nobody's abstaining, I hope. Okay, everybody, have a great weekend and thank you. This was a very productive and, um, you know. Uh, great stuff. Yeah, really, great. really, really. really. Yeah. You, the, the Green Bank is working so hard and doing so many things. And, and, I, and I keep thinking we've come through COVID where the world stopped. And we handled COVID well. The Green Bank handled COVID well and was productive. So, um, you know, congratulations all. Goodbye, everybody. Take care, folks. We'll see you. Bye. -bye. Uh, bye. bye.